We good? Good evening, everybody. Great energy in the room. I'm loving it. Uh, my name is Leslie Irvine, and I have the honor and privilege to be the vice president and, and director of athletics here at Colorado College. And woo! So you're starting out the right way, because I do want to send a message back to our very special guests back here, who we're all excited to see. Um, to, to make sure that they understand how excited we are that they have taken time out of their uh, um, crazy schedules to, to come here and, and share some of their, their messages with us. And so uh, what I want you to do is, I, I know there's some tigers in the house, so uh, calling out the tigers, I need a tiger cheer, please. We're the tigers! All right, I'm going to give you one more shot at that. I'm a former coach. I'm in coaching mode. Let's go. So tigers in the house, please. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Now I hear there's some mountain lions in the, the house as well. Tigers. They're louder than you. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing there's some falcons in the house. Awesome job. Awesome job. Good, good. And I'm hearing there's some thunder wolves in the house. There they are. There they are. So we have, um, we have the honor and privilege to, uh, to have student athletes and, and administrators and um, community members from, from four institutions here sharing in this. And, and I love that that kind of speaks to the vision in terms of the collaboration in this city and the sport ecosystem, right? We're excited to, to be here. So uh, what I wanted to, um, to say, and, and as I introduce myself to the community, I'm living the dream right now. Uh, because as people talk to me about what is your vision and what is the institution's vision, I am a profound believer in what athletics can do for society. And we all know that, right? It's about it's about resilience. We're going to hear all about this tonight. It's about courage, and it's about how it's so much more than just playing the game, right? It builds community. For some, it's life. And um, what better stage as we think about, for me, what athletics can do as part of the educational experience, what athletics can do to just change the world, quite frankly. So um, I couldn't be more excited to, to use this stage to share that message. So thank you for coming to be a part of this. I think that's a serious to cheer, right? So what I want to do before I actually um, start to introduce uh, our, our very special people is I do want to... Um, thank and present the Capital Sisters videos. We're going to watch a short video here, and that will, uh, we'll learn a little bit about what the, the Capital Sisters are doing, and they were instrumental in, in putting this event on tonight. If you could play the video, please. It's really a pleasure to be sponsoring the Purpose Prize uh, in financial inclusion again uh, this year. And it's really a pleasure to introduce this year's winner, uh, Patricia foley Hinnan. Patricia has used her her deep, deep knowledge of microfinance, her strong commitment, lifelong commitment to helping women access the financial tools, products, and services to improve their lives. Women continue to be about 75% of the people who live on a dollar a day. They represent two-thirds of the world's illiterate. And a lot of times women don't have access to finance just because they were born a female. Why? Why do you do it? I do this work. You know, what gets me out of bed every day, because we all know this is not an easy road, is that we're missing right now 200 million females in countries where they have infanticide, gender selection, poor nutrition for young girls, because these cultures have this deep-seated bias for male children. They view females as an economic liability, so this is why it's so important that we empower women through entrepreneurship. And the way I see it, that liability is a lie about their ability.
I worked for Congress for 20 years evaluating international programs. I worked for the State Department on a special appointment to advance microfinance policy and financial inclusion. What I had seen is that billions of dollars in international aid hadn't really made women any better off. We had to tap the capital markets. I was climbing a 14,000 foot peak. I was thinking about all the people like me who really do want to make a difference. And then it hit me that I could create an investment fund to change the dynamics. Over the next few months, I started literally making an exit strategy for my career. Got these reports, the latest reports from great. the Philippines and from Guatemala. Yeah. Capital Sisters International is a nonprofit organization providing microloans for women in developing countries. We've developed the first zero interest thousand dollar bond called a sister bond that funds 10 women at hundred dollars each. And there's Sophia, she's 54 years old, married with three children two and years. had two years of wow. education. Wow. Our goal is to democratize investments so that the household level investor can purchase a thousand dollar bond. As a no interest bond, you put a thousand in and you get a thousand back. So it allows people to not have to, to weigh one thing against another, to think, well, I, I need to save money for my children's education, so I can't give it. But this way it can be put to use while it's still being saved. You know, the thing with the Encore career is that you're finally at a place in life where you can cross-fertilize all your experiences. I was born one of six children, all girls. And I had a father who I think probably wanted sons. When I was done with college, I was among the first seven women to work underground in Colorado in a mine. It took me three months to convince them to hire me. And I think that was a really good grounding in feminism. I never saw failures, honestly. I just saw opportunities. You're the kind of person who hears who, who, who hear, someone says no, you hear go. <laughs> were you born that way? My mom said my first words weren't mom and dad, they were why not. Okay. <laughs> I co founded seven nonprofit microfinance institutions to try various aspects of this model. I knew that these sister bonds were going to fly off the shelf. We started the bond initiative in 2011 as a pilot, and we had to actually temporarily suspend sales after it hit $1.3 million. Getting people to make a loan to somebody far across the world who can take that $100 that you would have spent at dinner or on shoes, and they can invest that in their business, and then you get your money back? I mean, what's not to love? I'm Patricia foley Hennen, and this is my Encore. Honored tonight to have Patricia Hinnon, founder of Capital Sisters, in the audience tonight. Patricia, can you please stand? Black and holes. Let us uh, thank you for the important work. And there are also several women supporters of Capital Sisters here tonight. Please stand so we can thank you all for the difference you're making in the lives of thousands of women and their families around the, the world. It's incredible. It's incredible. So I'm, I'm going to take some time now to introduce um, Marlene Bjornsrud, and, and Marlene is going to be our uh, facilitator and guide the conversation with Brandy and Shamila tonight. Marlene's going to kill me because I'm going to spend a little longer on her own bio than she would be comfortable with, and, and for those of you who know Marlene, that speaks to who she is. But Marlene in her own right is a rock star. So. Um, Marlene has been a leader and an advocate for women's sports as an athlete, coach, and administrator at the college and professional levels for more than 35 years. Marlene's advocacy at the national level has been extensive. In 2011, the White House Council on Girls and Women invited her to Washington, D.C. to gain a clear understanding of the council's purpose to ensure that all legislation takes into account the needs of girls and women. 
In 2012, she was honored to engage in a small group conversation with First Lady Michelle Obama about women's rights, Title IX, homophobia, and the work of the nonprofit that she had founded, the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative, um, otherwise known as BOSI, in engaging female athletes to inspire physical activity among young girls in high poverty communities. As a leading expert on gender equity in sports in the United States, Marlene has been sought out by an international groups to speak in their countries. The Japanese Center for Research on Women in Sport requested her assistance in creating an academy for women's coaches in their country, modeled after our own NSA Women's Coaches Academy in this country. She continues to serve on the faculty of the Japanese Women Coaches Academy annually. Marlene's lifetime work of helping girls and women find full participation in sports this is a really big deal, was recognized by the International Olympic Committee in 2013 with its prestigious Women in Sport Award for the continent of the Americas. She joins a very select group as a recipient from the United States. The only previous winners from the US were Donna Lapiano and Jackie joyner Kersey. Marlene began her career in sports at Grand Canyon University where she was named the school's women's tennis coach in 79. She won a national championship two years later, so she doesn't mess around. In 2000, with the formation of the first women's professional soccer league in the United States, she was named the general manager of the Bay Area team, which won the first league championship in 2001. In 2004, with the U.S. women's national team, soccer stars Julie Foudy and Brandy, hence the connection, she founded Bossy. Also of note, like many outstanding sport executives that live in Colorado Springs, um, Marlene is a native of Colorado Springs and has recently returned here after 48 years. So it is my pleasure to welcome Marlene home and to the stage and as my dear, dear friend, Mar. Good luck. You know, when, when somebody reads and it's that long, you just know you're old, that's all. So, but uh, you know, I am so proud to be back in Colorado Springs, a city that I left after graduating in 1971 and really never thought about coming back. And yet, it was time. And I can't be any prouder than to share with you two of my dearest friends who really are global change makers. And when the Capital Sisters of Colorado, the group in Colorado Springs wanted to do a special event, I said, you know what? I have a friend from Afghanistan and her story is profoundly good. And she now lives in the US and is doing amazing, amazing work using her sports platform to really change the world, especially for women and girls in Afghanistan. And it just so happened I called Brandy and said, look, you're coming to Colorado Springs. <laughs> you know, I was Brandy's boss for a few years. That is not a hard, I mean, not an easy job. I don't think they paid me enough. Um, but Brandy said an immediate yes. If we're talking about how to use a platform to really do good, good work in the world, count me in. So let me first introduce to you my dear friend from Kabul, Afghanistan, now living in Washington, D.C., and wanting to move to Colorado Springs, <laughs> Shamila Kohistani. <laughs> and perhaps one of the most well-known women athletes in the world, in 1999, when she took off her shirt. <laughs> uh, I was actually supposed to be in Pasadena for that game and chose not to go. Tell me, what a, I was not even old then. So, um, and I found myself in a pub watching the game and when she stood up to take that kick and I knew she was my friend and I cared about her, I simply got under the table. And I didn't watch it. I never, I've seen it a million times since. I didn't see it live. But Brandy is a change maker in every sense of the word. So I'm so pleased to introduce to you Brandy Chastain. Can I say 
say something real quick? Well, this is so typical. Of course. Uh, I need to buy a bond for, yeah. I'm in, okay? I just wanted it to be said. That's it. Yeah. After the film, as I walked back, that's the first thing Brandy said. How, how do I write a check? <laughs> So uh, I do hope and invite all of you to stop by the tables in the back and find out more about Capital Sisters because they're changing the world one family at a time um, by supporting women. So you can buy a bond. I'm going right. to. Thank you. Um, this is not going to be a difficult conversation to moderate. Brandy and Shamila just met each other at noon today. And they have not stopped talking. No, 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 I haven't stopped talking. She's been listening to me. Well, <laughs> I mean, Brandy, no, I've Brandy, been asking questions. <laughs> Brandy's very curious, and that's one of the things I've always loved about her. Um, just curious about why, and why do things happen, and what can we do about it? So I thought it would be fun to kind of ex start our exploration, taught because there are very different worlds that you grew up in, Afghanistan under Taliban rule, San Jose, California under probably... Silicon Valley rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger rule, something like that. But I thought it would be really interesting to hear a little bit about your family background. So Shamila, maybe you start. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here, specifically sitting next to this amazing woman. Um, I grew up with um, my six sister, one brother, and my parents in Afghanistan. Uh, we never moved uh, out of Afghanistan. We lived even during the Taliban era uh, because it was very difficult for my father to, you know, have eight women at home who none of them are able to get an education, work, work outside the house, and just pack and leave. So for him, moving to another country during conflict was much more difficult to think about. So he decided to remain in Afghanistan. So after the fall of the Taliban, um, my dad knew that having seven daughters, you have no choice but to send them to school. Um, so he uh, was the breadwinner of the family and really truly invested in me and my sisters because he saw education as a way that would give us financial independence. And for him, living through you know, poverty during the Taliban, not being able to work, and ha seeing us at home basically doing nothing, so he was very determined to give us the opportunity of um, education and making sure we are independent financially before you know, we do whatever we want to do with our lives. So I would say that um, the reason I'm here today is because of uh, the love and support I got from my parents. Because you know, living in a conservative society where there are so many, um, you know, um, there are barely any opportunities for women, and you're always limited to doing certain things. It was the support of my parents that got me here, and I'm very thankful for them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Marlene should have teed me up first, because I don't know how. My, my story is similar in that I had great love and uh, caring from two wonderful parents um, growing up in San Jose in a community that was very progressive and you know I always felt that I could do anything um, my my parents both encouraged me to actually they probably encouraged me to slow down some because I was a little bit wild I'll be honest she was the type of woman who saw obstacles as opportunities and we didn't have the kind of relationship where I, they sat me down and my brother down and said, okay, here's the lessons of life. Basically, my mother was um, an example. She lived by example. She treated all people kindly, bless you. Um, she, she, was a, a, she was involved in as many things as she possibly could be, always with a smile on her face. 
um, a hard worker, my, and like my father as well, he was, he, my, as it turned out in my family, my mother was probably the, the breadwinner and my dad was more of the, the emotional support. And, you know, they made a great pair. And so when I was very young, like around six, seven, they recognized that I was a very rambunctious young girl. And right as I was between seven and eight, soccer came to my community. We have no prior experience in it, no knowledge of it, but they were willing to take a chance. And so everything that happens in my life from that moment going forward is because of their love and their support. And they're, they're really, I, I would say vision, but if I, if I had the opportunity to ask them, they would have probably said, we didn't know what we were doing. We just, you know, we loved you and we wanted you to experience as many things as possible. So that's kind of a little bit of my background. So I'm so interested why soccer with both of you? What was it about that particular sport that just drew you in? Well, for, I think for initially for me, it was any sport would do. It, if it was tree climbing, jumping off the roof into the pool, I mean, jump, you know, riding your skateboard and jumping over things. And I mean, I had skin knees. I played football in the street. I actually uh, believed I was going to be in the NFL <laughs> because it was really, it was the only team sport that my dad shared with me that we saw on television. And my mom's uncle, who was my godfather, played in the old NFL with the leather helmets. And so I thought, I like football, I, I'm gonna play. And I played youth football growing up, but I think why soccer, was, and my mother loved tennis. She would have loved it if I was Serena Williams, I'm gonna tell you right now. Uh, I would have loved to be Serena Williams. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I use Serena Williams as an example every day with my young soccer players. Um, but uh, it, what, I think why soccer is because uh, it came around at a time when it allowed me to play um, freely and express myself in a competitive environment where I could be physical, I could get dirty and sweaty, and, um, you know, I could, and this is, just shows, you know, I had a very massive uh, evolution as a person. I like, I feel very good about this. I was a terrible teammate because I wanted the ball and I wanted to score, and it was all about me, but soccer kind of gave me that place to grow my confidence, and, and it just felt so good every time I went out there, and I just couldn't get enough. So Shamila, in Afghanistan, you probably didn't see much sport, because for mm -hmm. much of the time, we understand there, you didn't even have electricity, mm -hmm. so you couldn't see, but there was men's soccer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that, was it the only sport or what drew you towards soccer then? Um, so I think for me growing up in a society as a woman or a young girl always told what I can and cannot do. So my opportunities were always limited. So I started playing on the street with the boys because um, I had a lot of anger and frustration towards people in society in general because I was treated you know, as a girl, I could not do certain things. So for me, I was like, why can't I just play with the boys on the street? Why can't I play soccer? So, and even there was a period of time in my life that I wore my brother's clothes because I really wanted to be accepted and be, you know, encouraged by other people. Oh, that's good, you wanna play soccer. But it still didn't work. Um, so for me, it was more of like, I wanna do something that's forbidden for women because I wanted to prove a point. So for me, playing soccer was just not, um, of course it was fun, I loved it, but in the process, I was tr trying to make a point. So by playing soccer, I, um, I was, my goal was to redefine femininity and really challenge the gender norms that has been dictated in women's life in, in Afghanistan for so many years. And to be able to do that in a conservative society, but having my parents to support me, of course, because I wouldn't be able to leave the house if they wouldn't support me. So I was able um, to even have like discussion with people about, um, you know, culture of a sport in general. Why are women not able to play soccer? Um, but it wasn't just the sports soccer. Um, even there were like tennis teams or. 
um, basketball team, but still it wasn't, um, the sport itself wasn't very promoted or accepted in the society. So me picking a sport that women never played was a way that I was challenging the society, but also making myself feel better that I'm doing something about, you know, the situation that yes. a lot of women are in. Yes. Um, and then eventually I fell in love with the game because it gives me the opportunity to run around, be aggressive, get all the angers out before I go home. Uh, so it was a great opportunity for me to utilize soccer um, to promote the game for women in Afghanistan. Well, I know you're the moderator, but I gotta ask you a question. <laughs> at what age were you having this internal years. conversation? <laughs> so at like, that time I wasn't thinking about everything I'm saying okay, now. Okay. I was, it was like, wow, happening. you were quite a girl. <laughs> this <laughs> I was just running around. <laughs> it was happening based on uh, the society I was living. It was a reflection of that. But um, for me it was like, okay, so why people say, women shouldn't play soccer, they need to be, um, you know, well behaved, respected. And I say, why can't I be respected and play soccer? Were you a teenager? Yes, I okay. was 15. Okay. <laughs> so for Very me, it was, um, and also like, you know, it opened a conversation yeah. that was never been talked in the society or people never talked about it. So that was an open conversation for me and then when we had more goals come in, then we would like, you know, reach out to the media to talk about why we decided to play soccer, trying to like promote the culture of a sport for women in general. Yeah. So I, I neglected to say that at eight o'clock, we're gonna stop and invite you to ask questions. Um, and because I tend to get wrapped up in the conversation, my phone alarm's gonna go off, so <laughs> it's not gonna be a fire alarm or anything. But, but I do want you to be thinking because there's such um, rich kind of conversation that is happening already that I really want to invite you all to have the opportunity to ask Jamila and Brandy questions. Um, speaking of just kind of breaking norms, Brandy, in 1999, when you took that penalty kick and ripped your jersey off, at that moment in time, I was one of your bosses <laughs> at Santa Clara University. And I remember the president got calls that we bought a full page ad on the back of the major newspaper congratulating Brandy. And it was that famous iconic pose that you saw. Um, we had lots of people call and say, how can you promote such an immoral act? <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh, immoral act. So, but something shifted there when you did that. And I know it wasn't calculated, but talk to us a little bit about that moment. Well, I, I think just so you, we can all just have a, a better picture of, you know, I think that, that moment is, um, is, a, is a lifelong journey, right? And so when, when you have your moment, I hope that you're willing to embrace it as fully and as uninhibited as you'd like uh, and in front of as many people as you, as you can. Um, <laughs> because uh, as, we, as we know, because of that, that moment, when something like that happens, it changes paradigms, it changes belief systems, it challenges um, societal norms, it, it gets people talking. Now, that was not in the plan. Um, all, honestly, th that moment was genuine. It was about celebrating not just the kick, but that lifelong journey to that moment. My, my history with the women's national team and through soccer, um, if you put it on a graph and if success was up here and this is the beginning of time, I think, you know, most people think, oh, you've won two Olympic gold medals and you've won two World Cup championships and it's just this big straight ascension to the top. And the middle was really messy and it was really difficult. And even in our journey as a team in, 
in discussion with U.S. soccer and what is the contract and where do we stand and how do you value us, that wasn't easy. And so I think you have to know that when you look at that picture because that picture then does represent this letting go of, of all of that and celebrating the fact that we could be there and in that moment. And so I also um, got a few people um, who said the same things to me about, um, you know, why did you do that? You're sexualizing sport. You know, you've ruined it for the rest of the, you know, girls out there playing. You know, you've, you've taken something so great and you've, you've, you've turned it into a different story. And, and I think those conversations are very valuable because the other 97% or 98% of the people saying, this is so incredible, I get to high five and say, tell me there's your story about where were you when it happened and how did you feel? That, I love hearing that. But the other 3% or you know, whatever the population was, I got to sit down and say, okay, here's what, what it was to me. Explain to me what problem it is that you see with it. Let's bridge the gap. And let me help you understand the joy of sport and the relief and the satisfaction and the elation that comes with doing your life's work. And for that moment to now, the reason why I say it's important for you to celebrate is because of young girls like Shamila around the world who I remind my young players don't have an opportunity. And when you do something good, if you don't feel good about it, nobody else can. And Marlene, and we're talking about changing the world, and these are the moments that change people's worlds. And intentional or not, um, we have to be able to embrace the good things we do. And so I look at that picture, I've looked at that picture now for 20 years, <laughs> and man, I'm telling you, it's hard to live up to. You gotta go to the gym more often and <laughs> eat less ice cream and you know. Uh, and it has, it means different things over the years to me. But one thing that's constant is this concept of just being uninhibited and being comfortable with who you are. And because there was nothing, there, I'm not hiding anything. You know, that was it and feeling really super relieved, number one, and grateful, number two, and proud, number three. Yeah. How many of you, many of you weren't born then, um, <laughs> but for those of you who were, how many of you remember where you were when that kick happened? Yeah. Oh, I need all your stories. Yeah, wouldn't it be great? Well, you come back to Colorado Springs. I'll come back. Um, I bet most of you weren't under a table in a pub. You know. Um, you know, that moment was very impactful for me because I remember feeling like it, it was just like the weight of the world was gone. Um, and as a, a long-time advocate for women in sport and girls in sport, I felt like this is the moment. This is the moment that's going to change everything. And unfortunately, we still go back and forth. You know, sometimes there's a women's pro league, sometimes there's not. The WNBA is doing well, then it struggles. Uh, college sport, you all know. Are there 100,000 people coming to your games? You know, UCCS, yeah. <laughs> I thought so. I, I thought the traffic jams on Nevada have been brutal on those soccer days. Um, but I just, but there are moments. Uh, another moment that I know Shamila had was in 2006 when ESPN called her and said, we want to bring you to Los Angeles and present you the, 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 an ESPY, the Courage Award. So Shamila, talk to us a little bit about that moment in your life. Sure. Um, if I would say that uh, one thing I'm proud of when I started playing soccer and what I have achieved so far in my life is uh, receiving that award in 2006. And it's not um, because I received it, but because I, have a, I had a wonderful teammate who supported me to make sure 
that I present all of them and the rest of the women in Afghanistan in the world stage because a lot of Afghan women were just tired of you know, the media presenting them as weak or fragile and not being able to, you know, or not active in their society. But in reality, we were, um, you know, at the front line fighting for our rights, fighting for the right to education, the right to play sports, and the rights to, you know, um, be a woman in the society and not be discriminated. So those are the things that were happening behind the scene. Um, and then ESPN decided to come to Afghanistan and do a documentary on how the women's um, national team or soccer team in general started in Afghanistan. Um, I was selected with one of my teammates who we both were there um, from the beginning to basically start the process of establishing the soccer team in Afghanistan that were invited in Los Angeles to receive the Autorash Carriage Award um, on behalf of our team and Afghan women. So that was the proudest moment for me. And that's how I met um, a lot of great people here who became my mentor. Uh, Julie Faudi was one of them who is a great, who has been a great mentor for the past 10 years in my life. Yeah. So we've talked a little, that word mentor, role model. I know when, um, when Brandy came in to meet Shamila for the first time today, I, I mean, I could feel the energy. Um, and, and Shamila said, this is one of my heroes, you know. Um, so I think it's important for you all to understand because when I grew up in Afghanistan, I had no role models, bottom line, because it's, um, you know, a patriarchal society, everyone only look up to men, even if it, it doesn't have to be sport, anything you do. So, and everyone praises their father, not that it's a bad thing, but like we often forget the sacrifice our mothers make and the women make in general. So, you know, it was important for me that people know that, that the reason even I am here today is because of my mother and the great mentors who are supporting me. So. I didn't have any mentors when I played soccer until I came to America. I met Julie Faudi and I learned about, you know, the first youth women's national team, the sacrifice they have, um, you know, given, the hard work they have done with the Federation and fighting for everything. So in a way I kind of connected with them, not even knowing them. So when I met uh, Brandy today, it was like, oh my God, like she's my best friend. Um, and I asked her if she could be my best friend. Yeah. <laughs> I said yes. <laughs> so it's like, and it's because although we grew up in two different parts of the world that are so extremely different, but the way that we both fought, fought for respect as athletes and we fought for gender equality, and it brought us closer, you know, it brought us together very closely. So I was able to like tell, um, oh, I heard this about how you were fighting with the frustration and it reminded me of myself back home when we were trying to establish the team. Um, so for me, looking up to these women when I was young living in Afghanistan, gave me so much hope and inspiration because that was the first time I met a competitive woman athlete who is, you know, playing at the highest level. Um, and Julie was like basically my mentor who actually supported me a lot throughout, you know, my career. And um, the reason, and she is one of the reasons that I am here. Um, so I'm very thankful for, you know, the mentoring she provided. And I will be um, grateful if Brandy continues providing <laughs> mentoring moving forward. <laughs> I was going to ask you the same thing, so. <laughs> it's a love fest up here. I feel like I'm back in the 60s. <sighs> so um, for both of you, you've, you've made history. I mean, you have. You have made history. But making history and leaving a legacy are really two different things. We, we know in the world of sport, there are a lot of people who make history but don't care about the rest of the world. 
Um, Brandy, would you talk to us a little bit about what you, not only the good work you do, but, but what does it mean to you um, with the, the work that you have been so involved in in Bossy in San Jose? Well, I will take only partial credit for the creation of the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative because Marlene was surely the driving force uh, to the creation and the necessity for us to do something positive in our community. And I'm a very proud San Jose native and a Bay Area native. Uh, I, I'm so grateful that I grew up in a community that, that honestly supported me in everything I did. Uh, so I, I have learned through mentors like Marlene that you know, doing good things is not so that you get credit, it's so that you really can make an impact. And so when, when, when we had our first WSA, uh, which was the Women's United Soccer Association, fold in 2003, it was, it was a dark time for women's soccer in the US because you know, here we are, we started off really well, we were champions, yes. Um, I mean, you, thank you. <laughs> Um, um, and, you know, that was a big deal, and I think we were trying to put women's sports on the front pages and f to get people to come to the stadium so that they could see firsthand the power and the grace and the elegance and the strength and the capability of these athletes, not women athletes, of these athletes. And we had women in our community who were playing other sports that were also doing great things. Um, what, before the WNBA, what was the um, ABL? ABL. Uh, and so there was a lot of great women athletes in our community, and they were doing great things outside of their sport as well. But we weren't making headlines, and so you know it was it was a disruptive time for women in sports. And 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 we said we have to do something. We have to keep women in sports alive. We have to keep making impacts in our community. And this is kind of the birth of the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative, but the cute little story to it, it was the Women's Sports Initiative to begin. And someone called Marlene and said, well, you know, most initiatives, most organizations need kind of a place, a connection, so people feel like, oh, I want to, I want to, I'm buying into that because that's where I'm from and I feel that. And so Marlene thought about it and she's very thoughtful and very respectful and she says, well, we don't want to, we're not just San Jose. We're not just, you know, Sunnyvale, Santa Clara. We're not just one place. We're kind of the whole Bay Area. So we'll be the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative. And then someone called to say, that is the best name for what you and Brandy and Julie are doing. And Marlene's like, well, that, okay, great. I don't really understand why you're saying that. And they said, because your acronym will be pronounced bossy. And you're bossy. And Marlene's like, oh, no, we're not doing that. And, and, and she, and I looked at her and I said, oh, yes, we are. We are, <laughs> we are being so bossy. And so the birth of bossy was to make a difference in our community with a population of young people, young girls specifically, who didn't have a support system to encourage them to see themselves as either athletes or see themselves as important or see that their health and wellness was a necessity to the growth and, and success of our community. And so, you know, we started out with 11 girls. Do you remember that day? I remember it like it was yesterday. 11 high school girls of all shapes and sizes from all over the world, actually, as it turned out. And San Jose State women's basketball came and we walked around the track. And we're gonna change the world. <laughs> And then the NCAA actually came to us and said, you cannot do that uh, because those are recruitable athletes. And we were like, well, not really. <laughs> See what we're working with over here? They were very enthusiastic sometimes. But we said, okay, it made us think twice. And I think this is where Bossy really started doing the work that I am so proud of um, these 14 or 15 years later. We started working with elementary school girls, second grade to fifth grade, bringing women like yourselves in the audience, collegiate female student athletes, 
as role model mentors. And why we're talking about this in a legacy format is that it not only changed the lives, and what we hoped is that it would change the lives and the pathways of these young girls, but it would also impact the, the collegiate female student athletes to show them that they mattered. And so, okay, you're not on the headline of every single uh, magazine or newspaper or on ESPN like maybe your male counterparts in basketball or football, but you make a huge difference. And you showing up changes the lives of young girls. And we have seen it firsthand for over 15,000 girls, if not thousands more than that, over these years. And principals would call us, and parents would come and say, what you were doing with my daughter is a game changer. And honestly, when people talk about the legacy of the women's national team, and, and they talk about the wins that we've had, it pales in comparison to actually getting our sneakers running on the playgrounds and seeing young girls who meekly came out of their classroom doors, not engaged with anybody else, not understanding this collective idea of team, not understanding goal setting and how, they, how powerful they were, to literally being firecrackers with running out of their, their, their classrooms, jumping and high-fiving and laughing, and the looks on their faces, I have chills. I mean, it literally brings tears to my eyes because they felt supported and they felt important. And that is a legacy that will not ever go away because they, we just dropped the pebble into the pond and now the ripples are literally going out generation after generation and now they will be bossy girls forever. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. Some of you, I know Colorado College women's soccer and UCCS have already talked to me about is there something we could do like bossy? Yes. Well, you can't be the Bay Area Women's Sports Initiative, but let's put our heads together and think what, what could happen if women athletes in Colorado Springs said, we're going to make a commitment to the little girls who live in poverty and probably will never play sport. So. Um, Shamila, talk to us a little bit about how you, you've used your platform, because you're no longer in Afghanistan. You now live in Washington, D.C., a newlywed. But even more so. And, and, uh, and even better, a U.S. citizen. <laughs> So, so talk to us a little bit about how you're using your platform now as an athlete. I mean, you, you've got a job where you're making a living, yeah. but what are you doing as an athlete for the women in Afghanistan or anywhere? So when I started playing soccer in Afghanistan, there was like nine of us that our goal was not to become the superstar soccer athletes to go compete internationally, but really, um, you know, create opportunities for the next generation after us. So if we go through all the pain and suffering to, you know, get respect from our federation, break the barriers, then the women coming after us will be able to compete at the highest level without, you know, fighting this um, inequality that we are fighting. So I, I would say that that would be um, something that I'm very proud of when I look back to my career. Um, you know, having the teammates contacting me who I haven't met, I don't know them, playing in a small club saying, hey, I know you, thank you for what you did. So for me, that is everything, because that was the goal from the beginning, to make it happen for other women. So being here, it has been a little difficult, um, although I'm in touch with a lot of players, but not be able to directly give. So I know that I made this place a home. I worked 10 years to get a passport. So that's a long time. Um, I didn't get it through my husband. Um, I'm very proud of that. Um, 
so I wanted to give back and, you know, giving speeches, doing a lot of public speaking in high school and college was something I truly enjoyed because I wanted to inspire young girls in America and encourage them to really take advantage of um, the situation here because, you know, you may complain about, um, you know, early morning runs or showing up for practice. I don't know what after uh, before dinner, but like for a lot of women around the world, they don't even have the opportunity to play soccer. So that is in a way, so the athletes here get to appreciate to what their parents are giving them, the schools they play at the club level. Um, so. And then I thought, what I can do for Afghan women, because of course I want to help people here or inspire young women, but also I'm always going to be connected to Afghanistan because that's where I came from and um, I want to give back. So I decided to, besides like mentoring um, players, um, to create like a YouTube channel to kind of promote a sport more in the community because it's still seen as a taboo for women to go to the gym, forget about even playing a sport. So I wanted to change that slowly. Although there has been now multiple gyms that women can go, it's um, of course only for women, um, but I wanted to do something because a lot of women don't have the opportunity to leave the house due to, um, you know, security, or some of them don't have the money to pay the gym. So I said, if, if I can create short videos and um, just show them how to do, like, really simple exercises, stretches at home, at the comfort of your home, and how that benefits them, that would make me feel better about giving back something to my people. Um, so when I started doing that, I was at the beginning um, not sure, but then I started getting a lot of messages where people say, oh, I did this, I felt so much better. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to hear more about me and my experience in a sport. So then I started like, you know, because I know how much um, soccer um, built, like gave me and in general, it built my confidence and my self-esteem. Um, uh, you know, it taught me accountability, hard work, importantly, teamwork, how to watch out for each other. So those are all the things that um, basically I use every day in life, and it's because I learned them through playing soccer. So I'm also, like, you know, mentoring a lot of players through these videos, kind of telling them why they need to go to the gym, be physically active, how, what is that meant for, their children, and also for themselves to be healthy um, and, you know, have the opportunity to do something for themselves at home. Yeah. 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 The sports platform is incredibly powerful, and I, you know, I, I think Brandy has been a household name. Jamila, this may be the first time you've heard of her, but both have a platform, and all of you Falcons, I know you're there. What is that? <laughs> oh, is that a falcon? Oh, oh it's yeah. A They're lightning bolts. I knew that. Um, the mountain lions. I'm going to say the lights in her eyes. So the, <laughs> yeah, the, thank the, you. The falcons, the mountain lions, the tigers, and the thunder wolves. All of you have platform. Every single one of you have a platform to do something good. So here's what we're going to do. At My little clock's going to go off in three minutes. And then we're going to have some time, about 20 minutes, for a question and answer. At about 8.20, 8.25, Brandy and Shamila are going to come down to this table and stay till 9 to just meet you all. They, they want to meet everybody they possibly can. Um, yes, they'll sign things if you want. By the way, I saw Brand. somebody has a tiny t-shirt of the Cyberase that you signed, and she's what? now here as a high school coach. Oh, and she right was on. this tall. So I hope you feel old. Solomon <laughs> um, uh, say. So good to have friends. <laughs> so um, what I'd like to do, though, in, in closing, I'd like each of you to take one minute to just share one example of something in your legacy work 
with little girls, with women in Afghanistan, that just gave you so much joy. Mm. Shamila? Shamila? <laughs> and I'm going to turn my alarm off. Um, I think I would say, again, it's the, the, the fact that they reaches out, reach out to me and ask me for advice or want to thank me for you know, being the fir one of um, many women in Afghanistan who went through the struggle to establish the team. I think that's everything for me. And it, it, when the first time I heard uh, a player contacting me, or some of even um, sports reporters contacted me as one of the you know first players in Afghanistan, and they want my opinion on things. And I'm like, huh, people do remember me. It's been a long time. So it's a great feeling in a way that um, you know, I did something that really impacted the community, and I did it for the women, mainly. Beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna go as fast as I can on this story. So I, I'm gonna give you a bossy playground um, story because it's, it's etched into my memory and mostly into my heart. So as Marlene knows, you know, bossy girls are supposed to be brave and courageous and come to the playground with a lot of energy and excitement. And so I was at one of our sites and I kind of rolled up on it and things were just kind of medium, you know? It wasn't like, it wasn't boiling. And so I whistled and I called all the kids in. They came into a big circle and there must have been about 80 girls. And I said, hey, um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Brady Chastain, and I helped um, create Bossy. And I was a soccer player one time, because you're too little to know. Um, but I once scored this really big goal. And when I did that, I had a celebration. And it made me feel really good. And I was wondering if there's anybody in the group that has a celebration they like to do when they do something well. And I was praying inside that someone would raise their hand, right? And one girl raised her hand, and I was like, oh, thank goodness. So I turned to her, and I said, would you be willing to come to the center and share your celebration with the group? And she said yes, and so she came to the middle, and I stepped back, and I said, go for it. And she froze. I was like, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to make her do it, right? Because that would not be good. And I said, do you want to do this? And her eyes were so big. She's like, I said, would you like me to do mine first? And she's like, yes. I said, OK. So I did something very pedestrian. You know, I jumped up. I pumped my fist. I was like, woohoo! And they were like, oh, politely. <laughs> like, they gave me a golf clap, right? I was like. Are you ready? And she's like, yeah. Because she figured mine's way better than that. <laughs> and so I stepped back again. And she did this like back handspring, double somersault, twisting perfect land. And the girl, and like perfect land. And the girls went berserk, right? <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. And I said, that is being bossy. Now go out there and be bossy. Let's light up this playground. So the girls ran off. And I mean, that day was on fire. It was awesome. So at the end of bossy, like the beginning, we all come back together as a team in our virtual locker room, because we don't actually have one. And we sit together, and we talk about what the word of the day, and we talk about did we meet our goals. We give them all a pedometer and a, and a notebook to set goals and see if they accomplished the amount of steps they wanted to take that day. And you know, we do our cheer. And so right after our cheer, the girls go in their different directions home. And I was talking to someone, and the next thing I know, I get this tug on my sleeve. And I look back, and it's the girl from the middle. And I'll never forget her eyes. And she looked at me, and she said, thank you for not giving up on me. Exactly. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, hold yourself together. <laughs> and I just said, I said, you are awesome. I said, that was amazing. Look at what you did, you know? the courage to come to the middle first of all, and then to do that, and you inspired all these other girls at your school, like that is tremendous. But I walked away from that moment thinking how simple it is 
to support one another and how much that means. I literally stood next to her. I did nothing. I actually did worse than, you know, like nothing. Because <laughs> I just got this. But I, I literally just telling her, I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. I got your back. No problem. And what she did in that moment, I'm hoping as a, you know, a graduate of Bossy Girls, and our girls are sometimes very transient, come from very transient homes, uh, homeless, you know, really not really great environments. I'm hoping that that moment has stayed with her because it's absolutely stayed with me. And just that idea is what I hope that all you uh, female athletes leave tonight with is the, the ability to impact someone's life by just being there in support. It's truly remarkable. Yeah. I'll never forget it. Yeah. 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 So now it's your turn, and I believe the system that CC has set up, two microphones, you just stand in line, ask a question, and when we tell you to get out of line and go sit down, you do that. <laughs> so um, who would like to start? Like right here. Oh, over here? Can you, can you just introduce yourself? Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, my name is Quinna. I go to CC. Um, first of all, Brandy, as someone with a TBI from soccer, thank you so much for pledging your brain to the um, CLF. Yeah, um, that was so cool to read. Um, I had a question. So in Afghanistan, I know in America a lot of times, like by the time you're six years old, your sport has been chosen. Your parents are sending you to like expensive camps to be the best at it. Your situation, like how rare is it to have parents that support you in pursuing a goal like that and how rare is it to be able to like fully focus on that and not just have it be a part-time what if kind of situation yeah so i mean i got very lucky to have the parents who supported me from the beginning when i said i want to play soccer and they were actually helping me kind of breaking the social barriers but um a lot of women in afghanistan didn't get to have that type of parents not because they didn't want their girls to play soccer and succeed but because of the society's restriction and the gender roles that made parents um feel uncomfortable and safe and they, they they are more worried about what the people in the society talk gonna t talk about them so for our family because my father has seven daughters so he's like okay people are already talking about us there's too many women in this family at the first place so do whatever you want <laughs> um, but there are families who truly um, believed in their daughters playing a sport. Um, they, may not, they may not be able to uh, tell you, hey, go to this school, go to this soccer club. But in Afghanistan, honestly, you just need their support and permission that says, yes, you are allowed to play soccer. We had some great women at the beginning who would actually come to practice. They would, their father would allow them, but their brother wouldn't like that. So they would come uh, without telling their brothers. And then, but then they would disappear. I said, hey, why didn't you show up for practice? They're like, oh, my brother was home this month or this week, I couldn't leave. So for me, that was in a way, I understood where she came from, but I was like, oh, my brother, do not dare to talk to me that way in front of my father. Forget about telling me where I can and cannot go. <laughs> But I was one of many lucky ones. But we had a, uh, the national team, the, we, the first women's national team that we created, some amazing women. Their parents were supportive. We brought them usually in our games. We created a festival where we invited parents, talked to them on one-on-one -on -one about the benefit of uh, letting their daughters to, ta to play sport, specifically a team sport, and what that meant. Yeah. Thanks for Thank the you. question. Thank you. Oh, come on. Anybody else? Come on. Don't, come on. Don't leave me hanging in the middle of the circle. That's right. We have a long time. Let's see a falcon. 
There's you guys, your Thunderbird things fly over my house all the time. <laughs> What's the deal? The windows shake, the dogs bark. Stop that. <laughs> okay, over here again. Hi, my name is Taya Schubert. I play for UCCS soccer. Can you and say your name again? Taya Schubert. Um, I guess this is a question for both of you. Um, so I kind of feel like a lot of teammates like go through a lot of like difficult times where they maybe they like don't think they're good enough or they're like they got cut from a team or like they're just <laughs> facing dark times. And so my question to you guys is like how like you both have probably gone through that. So how did you like get over those like obstacles like mentally? Because I think mental health is a really important factor when playing a sport. Well, like I said, um, my career was not this direct line in, you know, towards success. So I was, I, I missed two and a half years of college soccer due to having back-to-back -back ACL reconstructions. So having to sit on the sideline um, really uh, helped me have better perspective about how important soccer was in my life. And the joy that I got from playing the game and the friendships I made and all the other things that are byproducts of playing the game. And it was a really great opportunity for me to grow up. And I'm not saying that once that happened and I got through it, it was perfect because I, I made the national team and was on the first ever World Cup team that won in 1991. And then I was cut from the team. I didn't play mm -hmm. in the 95 World Cup team. And so that was really difficult. So to talk to that specifically, you know, I, having spoken with the CC girls earlier, there was a comment made about, you know, we all have this confidence in ourselves. And I asked, where does that come from? Because I, I think that's something that young women struggle with a lot because mm -hmm. we feel we have to live up to so many different ideals and beliefs externally. What I liked about the comment was that as an individual, I was very confident. I didn't have someone in a leadership role that believed in me, but I had to, I had to continue doing what I loved and making sure that I was seen. So you can't let anybody tell you you can't do something, and the only time that works is if you believe it. So I, I didn't believe it. I felt that that's where I needed to be and where um, I could be my best. And it was four years of really hard work. So it wasn't like I'm saying that, like, hey, you can make it happen. It, it's a, it can be a grind. It can be difficult. But self-confidence is only given by me, to me. Nobody else gives me confidence to be mm -hmm. the best person I can be. I earn, that, I earn that, and I hold on to those things because they belong to me. And so... Once I was given the opportunity, I promised to Julie Foudy, because at the time in 1995, post that World Cup where we came in third place, to Coach Tony DeChico was going to make a change. And at that same time, we happened to be in a, in a battle with U.S. soccer over the contract. And the team said, we will not be going to the first ever Olympic Games that we'll be having women's soccer. We're giving that up so that we can have a contract that values and highlights mm -hmm. the qualities that we bring to U.S. soccer. And I think U.S. soccer didn't believe that at first. And our leadership group called them on the bluff and everybody stuck together. And because of that, I had a problem. I wanted to go to training camp because I was asked to come back, but I also stood in solidarity with my, my friends and my teammates. And I asked Julie Foudy, here's a, another mentorship moment, what should I do? And so what I want you to hear from me is you are driving your own life. You are the decision maker. You are in charge. But having good people around you that you can go to in, in these moments and say, I'm, I'm at a crossroad. And I said, what should I do? She said, you go, because you need to be on this team. And so that was an invaluable piece of advice that I, le I learned that I use every day is, you're driving the bus, 
but be ready to be a support system to your sisters. Yeah, I would say growing up in Afghanistan, um, you know, always having a little opportunity to do what I wanted to do. Um, the first thing that I um, learned was to believe in myself, because once you believe in yourself, then other people believe in you. Um, and that, like Brandy said, it's something within you that you really have to focus on, because if people told me and my teammates, you will never be a respected uh, athlete, you know, and people, you know, tried so hard to, um, to convince us to give up playing soccer, but we didn't because we believed what we are doing will be amazing for the next generation. It was just not about us playing soccer. It was about the women coming after us. So once we believed in ourselves, then people started to believe in ourselves. And every athlete you're gonna hear from, at one point they were cut from the team and they weren't able to compete. But that only made them stronger. If you read about them, read, uh, if you have a chance, um, read Carly Lloyd's story of how she had the strongest comeback. And those are all inspiring stories that you should you know, read about whenever you're running through hardship because every athlete runs through hardship. There are times you doubt yourself. There are times you think you're not good enough, but you have to stop thinking about it and focus at the moment. Give 100% of yourself to practice everything because at the end, even if you didn't make the national team, you're gonna tell yourself, you know, I did everything in my power. And that's all that matters at the end of the day. And for me, you know, and my teammates as well, we had to believe in ourselves and fight for our right to play sport. It wasn't just given to us, oh, women in Afghanistan should have the right to play sport. We had to fight for it. So you have to fight for what you believe, whether people believe in you or not. Thank you. All right, I see a falcon. Yeah, I'm a falcon. <laughs> love Hi. those falcons. Yeah, I love these. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Lily Hess, and yeah, I'm a, I'm a falcon. That's what I'm <laughs> And uh, so my question is for Brandy, more specifically, because you talked about an opportunity you had when you were really young and how your parents helped you get into those opportunities. And my question is for how do you suggest we combat the hopeless mindset that kids have created at their homes with uh, families that have financial limitations and like class stratification problems? Did you hear the second part of that? No. Do you mean to say that, it again? The second part. Sorry, yeah, you're, really, you're, you're, I'm very you're wandering yeah, yeah. away from the microphone, so I was like. We couldn't yeah. figure out how to shorten this. <laughs> okay, I got it. There so you. for families that struggle with financial limitations and income problems that you deal with on a daily basis, how do you combat the hopeless mindset that is created in their homes? First of all, thank you for deciding to go to an institution where you will be representing the United States of America. I am very <laughs> grateful. I, I'm very appreciative. I had um, many service people in my family, so thank you. Um, that's a good question. Very heavy. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I think, I think, Bossy is a good example. You know, being a part of a, a, an organization that embraces the person, not the circumstance. Um, you know, giving the young girls a, a platform to play on was, I think, significant for them, and their understanding that they is. Uh, young girls in their elementary school and even the community that they live in uh, matter. Uh, so I think it's one, it's providing positive role models. Um, you know, again, I, I go back to the bossy girls running out to the playground after the, like the third and fourth week of being in the program. It's an eight week program. First week, second week, third week, eyes are down, no connections, like you know, no high fives, no, nothing. And literally, you know, once they know that they're supported, they, I think they felt anything was possible. So I think that's one is, so, you know, creating environments, becoming a mentor yourself, um, you know, positive um, 
opportunities around young girls is, is critical. Uh, the financial piece is difficult. You know, I, I work uh, as a, a coach in the Development Academy for U.S. Soccer, and we live in a time where pay-to-play is um, very prominent. And that's difficult for a lot of families because um, it's really not in their uh, ability to pay for that. And luckily for a lot of these clubs, scholarships are available for young girls. And so part of the, the equation is the being proactive as a young person when you need something, feeling the confidence to reach out. Um, and not seeing that as um, a, a negative, but seeing it as an opportunity to be a part of something and that there are people out there that are willing to support. I mean, we've seen it tonight with the micro um, baking and, you know, yeah, and the micro loans and just, you know, a hundred, what a hundred dollars could do. So we have scholarship opportunity. It might take some digging and some looking for, I think, but those opportunities are out there and there are women in the community who certainly want to help. Uh, those are two things specifically. Um, again, for me, I, I've had a lot of good mentors and teammates in my life who I didn't know in certain moments were going to need to be um, leaders for me, and they were. So, you know, again, putting good people around young girls, I think, is, is number one. And as Shamila has offered in her stories, um, it, it, it resonates down the line, and so being available to them is important. Do you have anything else, Marlene, you would want to add to that? I do not. Oh, man. <laughs> but, thank you. but thank you for that great question. Thank you. you know, so I think, I think this is going to be our last question. Oh, no. And then... And then Leslie Irvine is going to come back up, and then we're going to have Brandy and Shamila go back down. So last question, right over here. I'm Molly. I play for the CC women's soccer team. And I know that <laughs> you two obviously both were huge role models in kind of establishing support for women's athletics and women's soccer specifically in both of your countries. And I was wondering if you've seen kind of the trends that you set forth play out in other countries. And if you haven't, what do you think the next best step is to increase support for women's athletics internationally? Thank you. Another small question. Um, yeah, you definitely go to CC. <laughs> I'd say that about all of them. Wow. Yeah. I'd say that about all the... I'm going to say that about all the questions. They've all been very thoughtful. Um, uh, I, will, I will take kind of a first step stab at answering this question, and you can follow up with um, a younger perspective. Um, well, I know that women's soccer has had a global impact because of the sheer number of young women not only playing in this country, but playing globally. Um, when I started uh, playing collegiate sports, there were, I think, 75 Division I women's soccer teams playing. Now, there are three, over 325 Division I women's soccer teams playing. So, with the help of Title IX and strong women like Marlene leading the charge, we've been able to make a difference at the collegiate level in a huge way. I also know that in club soccer, so girls' soccer is the leading, um, how do you say this? That we, ha we lead the way in terms of participation, uh, more so than even boys' soccer. And so 99 obviously made a huge impact on that. I remember taking a trip with the USOC, perhaps, to South Dakota. And we went to a very small community uh, to a soccer festival, and they said, prior to your game, we had 1,000 girls playing soccer. I don't even think it was that many. Now we have 10,000 girls in a month's time. And so I think that just shows that exposure to opportunity <laughs> makes a difference. Ah, no pun intended. <laughs> 
uh, that exposure makes a great difference. And so watching this World Cup will show you the impact that women's soccer has had on the globe. How many new countries participated in the World Cup for the first time. The fact that we're talking about expansion of the World Cup. Um, it, the, the examples go on and on that we have made a huge huge impact globally. And again, as I said to your team earlier, it's not just are you the, uh, going to be a soccer player, it's are you taking charge of what it is what, that you're going to be? Are you going to be the doctor of the team? You're going to be the owner? You're going to be the manager? You're going to be, um, you know, whatever it is you want to be, it's not just are you the player. The opportunities are endless outside of that. And so I think it's that mentality that goes along with um, that growth that's really happened. Are we where we want to be? No, because we're still talking about pay equity, which is a really irritating to me. I'm frustrated, I'm exhausted, I'm tired of having the same conversation for 20 years. I feel like what the women's national team is doing right now um, and what US soccer will do is the right thing and to create an environment where they value their female players as much as they value their male players uh, on the financial side. Because I know they've been valuing us a lot because they've been standing on our, on our platform saying we win championships. Yep. And when they say we, they mean the women, right? right? <laughs> so um, I know that we're going in the right way, but we have a long way still to go in that regard. Did yeah. I get mad about that? <laughs> Sorry. A little bit. Yeah, um, so while the World Cup has a huge impact in the world, and um, an example is that, you know, America, American team and a lot of European teams are, of course, not where they want to be, but in a great place compared to teams in the Asia, Asian country, Middle East, the Eastern country, or even Latin American country. Women are still far, far um, from reaching gender equality, or even some of them basically fighting for um, respect as athletes, as competitors. Um, if you, and I think uh, the, the World Cup had a huge impact on those countries, you know, they are watching teams playing at the highest level but they know it's because they have the resources available compared to them. So if you had a chance, look into the Argentinian team who had a comeback after a while, same thing with Chile. And if you look into what they were struggling and what they were fighting within their country and um, federation, it's very similar to what the US has been doing since the 80s and what people in Afghanistan or Middle East or athletes are fighting for. It's, we, we all have one thing in common, that we are fighting for respect, value, equality. And having a World Cup like FIFA, as we watch, is, it has a huge impact because we're giving these countries example of what they are capable or, or able to do. So then they put pressure on their federation, on their community, they have to you know, work so hard to say, hey, we want to be able to compete with them. So it has a huge impact. I personally think we, the US and a lot of European countries are becoming a role model for countries who are still trying to develop the game of soccer for women. Great. So I'm going to ask Leslie to come back up here and again, Thank you to both of you for coming you. to our fine city. That was incredible. And I wish I had three more hours of this um, plus plus. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about and, and sitting and hearing all the messages and all I can think about is there is so much good in sport. And as I'm, I'm inspired by seeing the number of student athletes in the room, and, and what I want to encourage you to think about is how do we take that 
good in sport and as leaders and have this exponential impact. And you know, just a quick story, um, and it's funny how the world works sometimes, but Marlene and I met 20 years ago when I was um, the head field hockey coach at Stanford and Marlene came knocking on my office door and said, hey, we're looking for student athletes to support the Bossy Initiative. And here's the advice is find ways to say yes. And, um, and we've had a relationship since then and, and look at the exponential impact as we think about an event such as this. So Marlene, thank you. Yeah. I also want to say that um, this is a special community and, and I'm learning that um, we, we heard your challenge to, to the community here to be thinking about bossy in this community and, and I, I know and, and I'm hopeful that uh, this may take some legs and, and run. So I heard you on that. And did we not? Did we hear her? Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of thank yous um, uh, before, you know, we have a, a couple of little gifts uh, for both of you. Um, but I do want to um, thank, there was a, a small group of us um, who said, and, and Marlene kind of brought this to me, and there was a small group of us who gathered around a table and said, hey, can we pull this event off? This would be fantastic. And, and they all found a way to say yes, right? Uh, Anne Goodman James, um, who is our senior woman administrator and, and swim coach. I don't know if you're still here, Anne, but thank you. Um, Andy, our uh, assistant women's soccer coach in the middle of the season, was right at that table. Heather Carroll, who is a trustee here and, and um, a visionary around this. Laura Rosendo, and Marlene, um, thank you for, for um, all your support around hosting this event. Um, Brenda Soto, who I essentially said, you know, we have two uh, game changers coming to campus and I'm gonna need some help pulling this event off. And so Brenda and your staff, um, thank you so much. You've been such a pleasure to work with. And, and to Colorado College who essentially said, you know, hey, I have this idea of bringing this event, who said yes, 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 all the way. So um, thank you to, to um, all of those people supporting this event. So I do, um, um, I have two things to, to give you here. And Patricia, I think um, Capital Sisters also wanted to give something. So can I bring you up here as well? So what we have here. Is we have um, replica jerseys. <laughs> of the Tigers here. Let's see. So we have um, officially adopted you as Tigers. We have a game Friday. If you, we, I don't know if you have any eligibility left, but we, it's a big game. You could take this. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. This is uh, it's cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Patricia? Uh, I missed that. Sorry? Is this my con? I think Patricia wanted to say a few things. So thank you. Uh, the reason I know Shamila is because we just raised a million dollars for microloans for women in Afghanistan. <laughs> and when she, when she heard the news, she was very moved and she said, if there's ever anything I can do for that organization, Capital Sisters International, just let me know. She's been sorry ever since because this, <laughs> we have her speaking all over the place. You can see she's such a powerful, such a powerful role model for all of us. So I brought you a little gift. This is actually handmade from the women borrowers in Guatemala. Uh, for I told them I had special guests, and so these are for you too. Wow. Actually, knowing these two, these are more probably for your partners than for you. <laughs> They're handmade aprons with embroidery. <laughs> oh, this is great. I love it. Oh, this is beautiful. Yeah. I will I love it. absolutely use it. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Yeah. Brandy, Shamila, I hope you know how much we appreciate you being here with us. and. Um, to everyone who came and joined us tonight, uh, 
it was um, Marlene shared, uh, Brandy and Shamila will be here for 30 minutes. Um, who they, they want to meet you, come on by, shake their hands, um, say thank you. And uh, I hope everyone had a, a great night and, and an inspiring night. So uh, thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you.